Okay. Hello, good morning out there. This is uh, Joel Mott with the New Jersey Pinelands Commission. And uh, I'm coming to you uh, from my home today with the uh, Pineland Speaker Series. Uh, this morning's presentation is gonna be on the history of the Pinelands. And I'm looking to start in a couple of seconds here, right about uh, 10 o'clock. Um, I wanna thank everybody for joining. Uh, we've really enjoyed the uh, presentations we've had so far, and uh, we will continue um, through August, basically every Thursday, having another uh, Pinelands presentation here on our YouTube channel, um, starting at uh, 10 o'clock on Thursdays. And with that, I'd like to uh, start the program. Uh, my name is Joel Mott, as I said, I work for the New Jersey Pinelands Commission as our public program speaker, I generally, uh, or public program specialist rather, I generally do a lot of education programs. I speak to a lot of students. Um, we do both in-class education programs and uh, also at our office, we have a nice uh, Pinelands education um, exhibit. It's the Candace Ashman uh, Pinelands educational exhibit. And uh, right now the office is closed, uh, but as we get back to a little more of a normalcy, I welcome you to come to our office and it's a great way to learn um, about some of the things I'm going to speak about today. Um, I grew up in Tuckerton. My family's been fortunate enough to live in this area since the early 1700s. I'm actually the 10th generation of my family living uh, within the area. Uh, my son's the 11th. So I've got some long uh, existing family roots. And that's um, one of the things that's always kind of uh, held my attention. I've had a great interest in the local history, uh, it's, you know, tied to my family. And um, as a kid growing up, I spent a lot of time uh, right on the edge of the Pinelands. I said I grew up in Tuckerton, so we had the ocean and the bay on one side and the Pine Barrens on the other side. Uh, really the best of both worlds. Uh, you know, growing up, we drove around the woods a lot and I said, man, where do all these roads go? And sure enough, as I found out later in life, all those roads had names. And in most cases, they went to small communities or small little industries that were there at one point in time years ago that are no longer there today. And that really was uh, one of the things that drove my interest in learning about the Pinelands is what were at those towns? What were those communities? You know, what's, what's the story here? And um, I learned a lot of stories. And for the most part today, that's what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna share you know, some of the things I've learned about the Pinelands I'm certainly not going to cover all the history of the Pinelands. I would be here for hours and hours if I tried to do that. But uh, I'm gonna share with you today, kind of my thoughts, my insights to the you know, history of the Pinelands as it relates to uh, you know, people and the ecology and that balance. You know, the, the first thing that's important to know about the Pinelands is it's a balance. Uh, the Pinelands has been shaped in a lot of ways by people and uh, people live here today and you know, we're as much a part of the story as is the ecology. And it's that balance of nature and people that uh, really makes the Pinelands a very uh, unique place and a place that I'm happy to have grown up in and happy to still live in here today. So to start that, I'm gonna switch the screen a little bit. And we're gonna get into the program. Um, Pinelands history, this is a neat spot. I'd like to start off with this spot because this is out in the middle of Wharton State Forest. It's a place called the Deep Run, and it's a very natural looking, beautiful place. And from what I can tell, it's actually an old cranberry bog. And it's one of those examples of it's a place that over time has changed. There was people, there was activity. Over time, it's been taken back over by nature. And in a lot of places in the Pinelands, particularly the state forest areas, uh, we're gonna see that interaction where there was people uh, the industry went away, the people kind of went away, moved to different on to other things, and the nature has kind of, ecology has taken back over. Just to get a basic parameter, you know, we'll talk about Pinelands characteristics, kind of set the stage. You know, what do we mean by Pinelands characteristics? It really has a lot to do with the uh, water in the soil and the fact that both are very low in pH. Uh, some of our really, um, Characteristic Pineland streams have a pH of like 3.5 to 5.5. Very, very um, uh, acidic. And uh, the plants, the animals, all have kind of developed for that area. And when you start to change that, if other factors kind of raise um, that pH value, 
we'll start to see a shift from native plant, pinelands plants, native pinelands animals to non-native. And that's one of the things that we're you know, very concerned about is keeping those characteristics. Uh, sandy soil, I mean, in a lot of ways, you could describe the pinelands as a gigantic water filter. And uh, there's places in the pinelands that can absorb well over of six inches of rain per hour. And it's really all sand. Uh, a lot of the top layers of the pineland soil are sand, different layers of are granules of sand, and they're able to quickly absorb water. As a consequence to that, the area has always been very fire prone. So the plants, the animals, anything that really survives and thrives here are all uh, both drought and fire tolerant. Because even if it rains, that rain quickly goes into the ground, uh, you know, for the most part. So it's always been a, you know, a persistent part of the uh, nature of the Pinelands is fire, and that still continues today. Um, on average, the area is relatively wet. We receive over 40 inches of rain pretty much every year, um, which is good because that kind of balances out the amount of water that's being taken out, also the amount of water that's being used by all the trees and the vegetation. Um, for instance, last year was a very wet year where we actually got over 60 inches of rain. And so that, that just shows you how much water is put into the system. Um, if you spend any time canoeing or cocking in the Pinelands, you're probably familiar with the term uh, cedar water. And a lot of the water, particularly in those streams, is kind of a darker color. And that really comes from a lot of the vegetation breaking down over time. It interacts with oxygen. And also there's a lot of um, iron in the soil as well. And that produces that kind of dark colored water. Um, Another important thing about the Pinelands to think about really is the water table. Um, in the wettest times of year, there are places in the Pinelands where that water table comes right to the surface. Uh, we're talking about uh, the winter time, early spring. And uh, you know, in the next couple of slides, I'm gonna talk about the aquifer. Well, when that water table comes to the surface, that means that aquifer comes to the surface. So it's very fragile. So what we do on the surface can certainly affect uh, the water below the surface. And uh, water, water everywhere. You know, any Pinelands program I think I'm ever, ever going to do is always going to be focused on water. Water is the key. Uh, when people first started living in the Pinelands, it was really about the water. Um, we think, based on the amount of sand below the Pinelands, that there is roughly or could be 17.7 trillion gallons of water. Um, that's the amount of sand that we have below the Pinelands and how much water we think can be held. Uh, in that layers of sand. Um, it's not like a lake. It's really literally sand with water in between all the nooks and crannies. Um, to kind of make that real a little bit, if you take all of New Jersey and you cover it 10 foot deep in water, that is a rough equation or equal to uh, the amount of water we think is below the pine lands. Also, that's roughly half of the water that's consumed by the United States, say, in one year is that volume of water. So that's how much water 17.7 trillion gallons of water is. Um, that aquifer is really uh, the lifeblood of the area. It provides drinking water for people in the Pinelands and outside the Pinelands, probably well over a million, maybe a million and a half people get their drinking water from the Kirkwood Cohansey. And that's the, the aquifer. Uh, there's basically levels of sand. The Kirkwood formation is the furthest down uh, the Cohansey sand is the top layer, which in some cases comes right to the surface. If you have a well, you're probably in a house, your own well, you're probably pulling out of the Cohansey sands. Uh, the towns that have big municipal wells that get, go down and provide city water, they're generally pulling water up out of the Kirkwood formation. Um, we got to remember that, you know, we got to put water in the system because there's water always going out of the system. One of the Key features of the Pinelands has always been the large areas of open space. Uh, that's vitally important because those open space areas are allows those aquifers to recharge. It allows the water to get back down into the ground. Um, there's lots of things that are taking water out, all the plants, uh, evapotranspiration, uh, you know, so we need a mechanism to allow the water in. So if we ever paved over the Pinelands, eventually we'd run out of water because we're no longer allowing water to infiltrate or allowing that natural water filter that the Pinelands is to you know, allow water to filter through. Uh, here's a, a better look at that. This is a, a satellite photo. This just shows a large intact forested landscapes. 
roughly 80% of the pine lands is either up in, upland, upland undeveloped forest or wetlands with water. So right there, you know, 80%. So what does that leave the other 20% for? Primarily people. Uh, traditionally, the communities in the pine lands are kind of set up around the edges of the pine lands in relationship to some of the streams in the pine lands. And uh, so right off the bat, you know, really about 20% of the pine lands is where the existing population and historically has more or less been focused on in the landscape. Um, we'll talk about the watersheds of the pine lands, just to kind of describe things. Um, there's uh, five. Uh, generally, I'll start up in the northeast corner with the Barnegat Bay watershed. Uh, that consists of things like the Toms River, Cedar Creek, Forkett River, Oyster Creek, uh, Mill Creek, uh, it's in the Manahawkin area, west of, west of Chunk Creek, which goes through like say West Creek, um, Mill Branch comes through an area of Tuckerton and that leads down to Tuckerton Creek. Uh, so that's all part of the Barnegat Bay watershed. Um, kind of on the Northwest edge going towards the Delaware is the Rancocas Creek watershed. And that's gonna have waters that kind of flow through the Pemberton area, uh, down by Browns Mills, over through um, Medford and all that is moving west towards the Delaware River. Uh, kind of in the core or the center of the pine lands, we're going to talk about the Mullica River watershed. And that, of course, includes the Mullica River, the Batstow River, the Wading River, the Oswego, um, Bass River, Natco Creek, Motts Creek, Ballinger's Creek, Landing Creek. All of them kind of feed into the Mullica River. At one time, it was called the Little Egg River, and that feeds into Great Bay and then heads out into the inlet, which is the Little Egg Inlet. And that's uh, the Mullica River watershed. Um, a little bit further south, is the Great Egg Harbor River watershed. And uh, that's, of course, the Great Egg Harbor River, the Tuckahoe River, English Creek, uh, Penny Pot Stream, Deep Run, a number of other small tributaries that all flow into the Great Egg Harbor. And uh, eventually they head out into the inlet, which is down uh, you know, by Ocean City, New Jersey. That's where uh, the Great Egg is. The last watershed I want to talk about is down south on kind of the western southern edge of the Pine Lands is the Morris River. And the Morris River and its tributaries uh, flow generally in a southeast direction down towards the Delaware Bay. And they are the, you know, the five watersheds that make up the Pine Lands. And over time, when you go look back at the history and where people start to settle and live in the Pine Lands, there's a great connection to these streams and these rivers because that's what was able to power things like sawmills and gristmills, all the things that became important for uh, starting little communities in the Pine Lands. And so there's a direct tie uh, to the, the streams and the rivers to where people ended up settling. Uh, kind of just to set the stage, uh, I want to talk about what the Pinelands is today. And really to do that, I need to go back to 1978. And uh, that's when the Pinelands National Reserve receives its designation. Uh, it was the National Parks and Recreation Act actually of 1978. And that establishes um, the Pinelands National Reserve. I refer to it a lot of times as the PNR. Uh, it's an area of 1.1 million acres, uh, portions of seven counties, 56 mis, uh, municipalities, and 22% of the state of New Jersey is within the, uh, the Pinelands National Reserve. Um, it's kind of interesting. It was the first national reserve. It's really different than any other national park because it's both a mix of um, private and um, public ownership. So there's kind of a split between what's owned by say the government, the federal government, the state government, uh, lots of counties and municipalities, and then what's actually owned by private people. Um, so there's really not a boundary, there's not a gate. Uh, there, you kind of drive in and out of the pine lands all the time without even noticing it, because uh, it's really just a, you know, a, a designation on the map. Um, that was the Federal Act in 78, and the Federal Act provided for if the state had a further leather of protection then that was done in 1979. The state was going to, or the federal government would help with uh, land protection and help with some uh, financially with funds for uh, land preservation. It was one of the, one of the initial thoughts behind the um, National Parks Act. So in 1979, the state of New Jersey passed the Pinelands Protection Act and that was signed by Governor Brendan Byrne. And that really set in place the uh, cornerstones of protecting the Pinelands. And, um, the, the main piece of that uh, was the creation of a Pinelands Commission with the more or less duty or job to create a Pinelands Comprehensive Management Plan. 
And that basically becomes an overall management um, scheme to preserve the natural resources, to kind of take care of the people living in the area and to provide for that balance. Um, the commission works with a number of people and by January of 1981, that plan is signed by Governor uh, Brendan Byrne. And that really is the, the framework of you know, how we live and develop uh, within the Piney Lands today. Um, here's the original uh, paper copy of it. Uh, this is a pretty interesting document. We do have it on our website. Uh, it has kind of two parts. It has a part one, which really lays out kind of everything you would ever wanna know about the Piney Lands as far as the people, the culture, the ecology. Uh, it really has detailed studies about the amount of plants, the amount of animals, and it really is kind of the background and supporting evidence for how do we protect and why do we protect the pine lands. Uh, the second half of the document is more of a um, legislative document, and that's really where you get these rules. And uh, the idea is the rules are set up to kind of promote orderly patterns of development to safeguard natural resources, encourage uh, compatible economic development. So it's really that balance. It's about preserving the resources, but also pres preserving the idea of the economy and people living and thriving in the area. Um, the cornerstone of the plan, I'll show you in a little bit, is going to be uh, nine different management areas. So the Pine Lands is kind of mapped out into these nine different management areas. And uh, they're all gonna have different levels of um, like development intensity. And that's really how we're going to spread out and provide for uh, that balance. Um, part of the rules and regulations were incorporated into the municipal ordinances. And really the main scheme about everything is to protect water quality and natural resources. We've always learned that if you protect the water quality, the water characteristics of the pine lands, that'll in turn protect the natural resources being anything from plants, animals to the water itself. And uh, that's kind of the scheme. Um, here is the map. This is the uh, land capability map. Um, this is more or less the zoning that's behind all those pine lands rules and regulations. 60% um, is in conservation. And that is uh, part of what's called the pine lands preservation area, which is kind of the darkest, uh, kind of the lime or green color. And then there's a green green, which is the forest area. Those two areas really make up the, the large 60% of the pine lands. And that's where there's the least amount of development occurring in the pine lands. Um, agriculture makes up about 10%. Uh, specifically, agriculture in the pine lands, we really think about uh, cranberries and blueberries. Uh, for instance, around the area of Chatsworth, New Jersey, uh, some of the largest cranberry uh, bogs and farms in the state are there. And then over by Hamilton, New Jersey, is where you're going to find a lot of the large blueberry farms. Both uh, cranberries and blueberries are native pinelands plants. And they are a very um, you know, important part of the economy. And as the rules and regulations were written, they wrote into those rules and regulations um, you know, exemptions for both the cranberry and the blueberry industry so they could continue to farm and they could continue to uh, you know, provide for that economic stimulus in the pine lands. Uh, there's about 12% of the pine lands, which is kind of a transition area. And that's what's yellow on the map. That's the rural development areas. Generally, those areas, you need around five acres to develop and uh, they're kind of the buffer between the more preserved areas and then the more densely populated areas, which you consider the development areas or the regional growth areas. Uh, they show up on this map as orange. And for the most part, the regional growth areas are pre-existing large communities that were there prior to the rules and regulations. Those areas have generally public water and public sewer. And uh, that's really where the most of the population of the Pine Lands lives in, in those uh, regional growth areas. Um, two other areas fall into that category uh, and they're the Pine Lands towns and the Pine Lands villages. Uh, they're represented by uh, purple are the towns and the villages are red. Um, and all they are are pre-existing communities. The villages, some of them are very tiny, places like Warren Grove, Chatsworth, uh, New Gretna, where there was a, a substantial community embedded within the natural surroundings of the Pine Lands. And so the rules and regulations allow for some development within those village areas to allow families and people to continue to live and thrive in those small communities. On a little larger scale are the towns and that, you know, places like Hamilton, Egg Harbor City, Tuckerton is another good example, 
up by whiting and their new larger communities um, that are kind of embedded within in the pine lands. Um, we do know over the last 40 years, uh, roughly 75% of all the development has really only occurred in 13% of the pine lands. In those three growth areas, that's where 75% of the pine lands has occurred over the last say 42 years. And that, that's really how the plan was developed. The plan was developed kind of as a balance to keep the areas of high uh, natural resource integrity more or less intact and then to allow the uh, population centers to be in areas that had the infrastructure to uh, go ahead and support those communities uh, going forward. Um, what, what's the pine lands today? There's, as we said from the map earlier, lots of upland forest, uh, mostly pine, some areas there's oak, some areas there's a mix of pine and oak. And a lot of times that's dependent upon the amount of fire. Areas with a lot more fire, you're gonna see a lot more pine over time. Uh, pine out uh, does better than oak if there's fire. If we take fire out of the equation, over time oak will supersede the pine without that edge of the fire. Uh, the fire burns, it kills a lot of the vegetation or knocks them down. But the one thing that comes right back is generally the pitch pine and pitch pine seeds are released by the fire. So they've got a built-in advantage when it comes to uh, fire. So it kind of goes hand in hand uh, with the area. Um, here's an example of a pine oak forest. As I said, some are more pine where you would say it's just a pine forest. Others, on the other hand, are a little more of an oak forest and some are kind of a mix between. Um, one of our transitional areas is what we refer to as a pitch pine lowland. And we usually see these pitch pine lowlands. Uh, you have the uplands and the wetlands and the in-between section where there's a mix of uh, upland and wetland plants is generally where we find or we define as a pitch pine lowland. Um, two uh, of our swamp areas make up a lot of our wetlands and generally they're described as hardwood swamps and that's where you're going to find your cherry trees, your gum trees, uh, a lot of your real pretty trees that we see in the fall and then uh, the other swamp uh, is the Atlantic white cedar swamp and uh, we've known from our history here uh, Atlantic white cedar has been a very important natural resource. Uh, it was always a very important component of uh, people making a living in the area and we know that it's also a very important habitat for a lot of our uh, threatened and endangered species. So that's really an area where there's that, that balance between preservation and preserving and you know, allowing the community to you know, make a living. Still to this day, there's a fair amount of uh, wildfire. Uh, you hear generally in April and May, that's our forest fire season. Uh, generally in February and March, uh, the New Jersey Forest Fire Service spends a lot of time kind of uh, burning some areas in a controlled burn. And the technique they're doing basically is they're reducing the fields in a con the fuels rather, which is basically the pine needles and all the debris around the forest when the conditions aren't optimal for burning. And then when they are optimal for burning, it's more of a controlled situation in April and May. Some of the worst forest fires have always been uh, in, in those springtime months, April and May. Um, pictures on the bottom show uh, an area that had a forest fire. Um, the picture in the lower left-hand corner is two weeks after the fire. You can see that area, it was burnt down to the, to the ground and it's starting to come back. And the picture to the right shows uh, that same area six weeks after that fire. So fire doesn't destroy the pine lands by any means. It almost just kind of re restarts it. And it's probably the most healthy thing for a lot of places in the pine lands. Where that becomes a problem is when there's people living real close to those areas. So that's where we have that kind of mix of, uh, you know, uh, wildfire and people's houses. And that's one of the reasons why there's the New Jersey Forest Fire Service to kind of help offset that, um, you know, that critical relationship. Uh, other wetlands in the pine lands, uh, we talked about the hardwood and the cedar swamps, but we also have a lot of savannas and uh, coastal marshes. Uh, savannas are a pretty important habitat for the pine lands. Savannas are generally areas where there's less trees. So there's a lot more sunlight. And uh, we're gonna find out that that's where a lot of the very showy uh, pinelands plants, a lot of the orchids that grow in the pinelands all grow in these savanna areas. Uh, and there's an important interaction there too. Uh, in most of those areas, that water table when it's wet comes right up to the surface. So you will have the opportunity to see standing water in many of those uh, savannas, um, you know, in the early part of the year, say March through maybe May, depending on how wet the season is. 
We know that there's a critical connection to all threatened endangered species, both plants and animals. They spend a lot of their time in those wetlands habitats. Um, part of the rules and regulations protect wetlands in the pinelands. There's really no development in the pinelands in wetlands. And that is really set up to help protect those threatened and endangered species because we know that it's a very important component of their habitat. Um, the same thing kind of holds true as the upland soils and the sand. It's again, very low in pH and very low in nutrients. So, uh, you know, plants that thrive here are plants that don't need a lot of nutrients and are used to those acidic, very uh, low pH uh, conditions. Um, the biggest difference is the soils. Uh, wetland soils are usually considered muck soils uh, and they actually do drain. They just drain at a much slower weight rate uh, than the uplands. So uh, water hangs around longer in the wetlands because it takes longer to go through those mucky soils. And thus for you have a lot more uh, plants that wet type plants, plants that like a lot of those water. And that's generally where we find, like I said, a lot of those really pretty orchids, uh, some of the um, things like swamp pink, that's a lily, uh, but some of those characteristic pinelands orchids uh, are really here because of those savanna areas. Um, another really unique habitat we have are intermittent ponds. Um, there's thousands of these throughout the pinelands. Um, the, the pinelands is generally thought of as being kind of flat, which is kind of true, but not true. There are a number of hills and, and larger deposits of sand. Um, but what we have are these intermittent ponds. And uh, this is say early summer. So this picture probably is, I'm gonna say for maybe May. And then if I go back to that same spot, say by August, they go dry. So uh, the fact that there's water here part of the time, but then the water goes away is fantastic for the frogs and the toads. We have a wonderful diverse group of frogs and toads, even salamanders that live here in the pinelands. If water stayed in these ponds all year, then there probably would be other fish species. We have a number of pinelands fish species, but they're more concentrated in the streams. Um, the fact that these ponds go dry means that those fish won't eat all the tadpoles and all the eggs. And that's really why we have such a diverse and really interesting frog and you know toad and even salamanders here in the pinelands. Um, one of the last special habitats I wanna talk about is the pine plains. Uh, this area is out uh, on portions of Ocean County, Burlington County. Uh, the easiest place to say it is on Route 539 between the Garden State Parkway and the little village of Warren Grove. Uh, you go through uh, one of the most distinct areas of the pine plains. It's referred to sometimes as the, the pygmy pines. Uh, it's really a mix of uh, pitch pine and lots and lots of different scrub oak. And uh, this is an area that has had a lot of fire over the years. Uh, you know, that term pine barrens, in my mind, I think that really comes from this area. It almost has kind of a desert feel to it, particularly in the summer, because it seems so dry there. But there are a lot of streams, there's a lot of water, and the water is really relatively close to the surface, but it just quickly sinks down into the ground. And that's the, uh, the pine plains. It's a globally rare habitat. It's one of the most largest areas of kind of a dwarf uh, type forest in the world. And uh, you can see it just by driving down Route 539, uh, like I said, between um, the Garden State Parkway and the little town of Warren Group. Um, the pinelands are considered a botanical treasure, which doesn't really go with the word pine barrens. You know, the idea of pine barrens was it was so sandy and so acidic, you couldn't grow a lot of things. But it turns out there is a lot of things that really thrive here. There's over 850 plants that uh, find home in the pinelands, 92 that we consider threatened and endangered. Um, that number sort of is in fluctuation, depending on different botanists would have that different number that changes from time to time. 92 is the, the standard number that we've used for a while. Uh, there's a number of plants that uh, don't seem to occur too many other places. Things like Kirsten's Beak Rush, Pickering's Morning Glory, and the bog asphodel in particular um, aren't known to grow any place outside of the pinelands, uh, which is you know, pretty interesting. The picture showed here on the left is uh, the swamp pink lily. And that is a, a plant that we see generally in cedar swamps that are very wet. And that generally blooms uh, in May for the most part. And uh, like I said before, uh, there's 27 wild orchids that are known to occur in the pinelands. Another thing the pinelands are known for are um, carnivorous plants. There's a number of pitcher plants, the purple pitcher plant, um, sundews, there's multiple sundews and 
they thrive here because they're able to get their nutrients not from the soil, but from the you know the bugs and the insects that they are able to uh, devour uh, you know through the course of uh, natural life. Um, so they have definitely a niche here. A lot of the speaker series programs are focused on plants, so I'm not going to focus too much on them today. Um, I will say that it's a pretty unique situation where we do have a lot of uh, southern plants and northern plants. Um, you know, the glaciers kind of pushed, they never made it all the way down here to the pine lands, but maybe they pushed some sediment and materials into the area. So you get things like broom crowberry, which is typically a tundra plant. And the further south you ever find it is here in the New Jersey pine lands. And then you get things like turkey beard, which is something you would find down in Georgia, but the furthest north you would ever find it is here in the pine lands. So we've got that overlap uh, both at the furthest extent of the ranges of a number of plants. Um, there's a lot of animals in pine lands, nearly 500 animals occur here. Uh, there's 43 that are considered threatened and endangered. Um, the one you see right here is the pine barrens uh, uh, tree frog. Uh, the pine barrens tree frog was considered endangered, um, but now it's considered threatened. And over the last 40 years of preserving a lot of its habitat, the population has come back and in some ways, that's a, you know, a really good sign that uh, because we preserve the pine lands, a great example is the preservation of the Pine Barrens tree frog. You don't really find the Pine Barrens tree frog any other places in New Jersey except the Pine Barrens. There are some small populations uh, down south in places like South Carolina, uh, where they have some little nooks and crannies where there's a small Pine Barrens tree frog population. But as far as New Jersey, the only place we're going to find them is here uh, in, in the pine lands. Um, now we're going to transition more into uh, the history uh, segment of the program, and I want to start with the uh, Native Americans. Um, you know, this is an old map. This is a Dutch map that kind of shows the extent of the Native American populations um, prior to European settlement. Um, I tend to use the, the term Native Americans. I worked for the Park Service for a number of years, and I got to work a lot with the Nez Perce, which is a tribe of Native Americans from out in the Idaho and Oregon. And uh, that's how they like to refer to themselves. They refer to themselves as Native Americans. So I've always kind of followed in their footsteps and, and used that term. Um, prior to uh, European settlement, there was millions of millions of Native Americans all over the East Coast. Uh, in New Jersey, hundreds and hundreds of thousands. Uh, and we're gonna see kind of a rapid change in uh, their numbers. And uh, you know, there's gonna be a, a number of consequences to the Native American populations from the uh, settlement of uh, Europeans here in the area. Um, from the archeological record, uh, about 10,000 BC, we can look at find tools and find where people were living uh, and surviving here in Southern New Jersey, primarily hunt hunting and gathering. Um, at the time of the European settlement, uh, most of the Native Americans in Southern New Jersey were the Lenape. Uh, when I went to school, I always learned the Lene Lenape and over time, we've learned that was kind of maybe the same word twice. And uh, the Lenape themselves and other Native Americans referred to them as the original people. Um, they were part of the uh, Guanquan Nation, and they were always known as a very peaceful uh, people, but also someone that had been around for a very long time. And that's where that concept of uh, the original people comes from. Um, they live primarily along the coast, both the Atlantic coast and the Delaware Bay coast. Um, they would go in and out of the pine lands. A lot of our roads today, you could actually still trace back to some of those old game trails and uh, trails that the Native Americans traveled back and forth. Um, focused on the natural resources, things like clams, oysters, uh, the, the bay and the ocean really provided lots and lots of great resources for uh, those, those Native Americans that were here prior to uh, European settlement. And we do know also, from the archeology, span but also just from the oral and written histories, there was a lot of connections. So the Native Americans say in Southern New Jersey certainly had connections with Native Americans in Massachusetts, further south, and really a wide ranging network of, of trade existed between those you know, Native American populations throughout really most of uh, North America or what we consider the United States today. Um, this is a shot of uh, looking at the end of uh, Little Egg Inlet, it's kind of down there um, as you look at the end of Southern of Long Beach Island. And this is uh, important in some, in some ways because, and this is the other angle that's a little beach out there you see, 
Um, this is what becomes Little Egg Inlet. And we know that around 1609, that's when Henry Hudson and some of his um, parties are going to start exploring the Raritan, the Delaware Bays. They're gonna come down the, Jer the Jersey coast and they're gonna start looking at all these little nooks and crannies. Um, this area gets the name Iron Haven or Egg Harbor and uh, for the abundance of the old eggs that they saw on the beaches and the shores. Um, so that's around 1609. Um, by the 1630s, we're gonna start to see uh, trading posts and small settlements developed in Southern New Jersey along the Delaware. Uh, and this is gonna be a mix of groups. This is gonna be some of the Swedes, some of the Finnish people, uh, the Dutch too are going to um, kind of have like the main focus. Ultimately, they're gonna gain control. Uh, Henry Hudson was Dutch. Um, and they're gonna kind of take control over the area, which is gonna be referred to as New Netherlands. And then in uh, 1664, um, there's, there's gonna be a treaty uh, between the English and the Dutch. In the, if the Treaty of Westminster in 1672, New Netherlands now becomes New Jersey. And then New Jersey split between East Jersey and West Jersey. Uh, most of West Jersey is uh, the Northern Western side of New Jersey. And then of course, Southern New Jersey and East Jersey is considered most of the um, what's new northern New Jersey. Uh, the line actually went right through what's part of Little Lake Harbor Bay today, uh, which is uh, pretty interesting. Uh, in 1673, uh, a lot of West New Jersey is uh, sold to Quaker interest. And that's really gonna further a uh, pretty large migration of um, primarily Quakers, but not just Quakers. Uh, a lot of people associate with the whaling industry. They're gonna start to move down the Jersey coast. Um, they're gonna start permanent settlements in Monmouth, Monmouth, um, Cape May, for instance, also over on the Delaware in Burlington. And then they're gonna kind of fill in along the coast uh, in some of these other, other areas. And that's really gonna be the first start of uh, you know, settlement of the Pinelands by the Europeans. Um, early settlement is very interesting. You know, some of those early Swedes, for instance, like people like Eric Mullica, if for instance gets the name, the Mullica River at one time was called the Little Leg River. And then over time it's been changed to the Mullica River. But they, you know, they really around the area. Um, they definitely had met some of the Native Americans and were really able to kind of be that um, kind of link between the Native American populations that were here and the Europeans that were looking to purchase and, uh, you know, settle the area. Um, sawmills and grist mills really are gonna be the, the start. Uh, and then of course, with all the lumber, it's gonna lead to uh, shipbuilding. As I said, a lot of these folks were uh, part of the whaling industry and you can see a pretty definite pattern of migration from say Massachusetts down Rhode Island through Long Island and then right on down uh, to the Jersey coast. Um, most of the, the sh um, shipbuilding at the time was part of the whaling industry. And at that time, they were actually able to whale right off of the beach. So it wasn't like we see in Moby Dick where they're out chasing the whales in the ocean. This was whaling right off the beach. And that's really what drives uh, early development uh, in the Jersey Shore and what's gonna then become eventually the Pinelands. Like I said before, the streams were extremely important because that's where you got the power to generate a sawmill. That's where you got the power to generate a grist mill. Um, so pretty much right on the periphery of the Pinelands. Um, European settlers, that's where that term pine barrens comes from. And like I said, it really had more to do with the fact that they couldn't grow some of the food crops like corn because the soil was just so acidic and so um, nutrient poor. Um, the pine lands was important because it provided lots of things that really were important for shipbuilding. White cedar became an extremely important resource. Oak was important. From the pitch pine, you were able to make pitch, you were able to make tar. Uh, turpentine was also, uh, got from the trees. Um, you know, the construction of large wooden ships uh, and coastal trade really flourished up and down the Pinelands. I mean, you had big ports like Boston, New York, and Philadelphia, but all along the Jersey Shore and the Delaware Bay, you had all of these little places you could dive in. If you were looking to bring a cargo in and not maybe pay a tariff or a tax, there's lots of places along the Jersey Shore where you could just slide something in. So it really uh, helped lead to that connection. Um, you know, sawmills probably were the most important thing to start because you needed lumber to build houses and structures. So like I said before, all those little streams, that's where you're going to start to build sawmills. Eventually, you're going to, a lot of the locals said, well, man, we're taking our, our 
our grist to other existing grist mills. And so they started to build grist mills right along here, the Jersey Shore and the Pine Lands. Um, lumber, lumber yards, boat yards, all generally start to you know, develop the Pine Lands area. Um, some of these communities are places like Browns Mills, Tuckahoe, Tuckerton, Port Elizabeth, uh, even Batstow. All these little communities are gonna really develop around those natural resources. Um, the area always, from the very get-go, had a, a you know a connection to shipbuilding. Uh, there's a couple of very famous boats that were made here in the Pinelands. Boats like the Garvey, which was a clanning boat. The Barnegat Bay Sneak Box also has its origins here in the area. And then the boat you see there is a cat boat, and uh, that's another boat that was used sailing primarily, but it was used to navigate the bays. Um, this is a picture of Tuckerton from about uh, the 1890s, I believe. Uh, when it was a, pros uh, you know, a really um, busy shipbuilding area uh, right, right along the shore. And to this day, there are still a number of boat builders that are building boats and yachts uh, in New Gretna, which is a little town in Bass River Township. Uh, Viking Yachts is, is still there to this day, building large, uh, large boats and, and yachts. So it's certainly part of the, the local history. Um, this is a pretty interesting map. This is a map from uh, 1729 and it's a postal map. So it shows all the pre-existing communities in and around 1729. Um, and you can see where there's a lot of people on the New England coast, in New England, the uh, Hudson River area. And then you can see as you come down the New Jersey coast, all the inlets are laid out and most of the people are gonna be up in Monmouth County over here in Burlington. And then you're gonna start to see Cape May and people fill in. Um, and this is that concept of East Jersey and West Jersey, if we look a little closer. Um, and it's interesting, if you look at the Pinelands area, it's uh, set up as woodland. And there doesn't seem to be a lot of development there within the Pinelands area. And in some ways that's still true today. Um, but the, the important thing was you can see where they have all the rivers laid out. And most of those population centers are gonna be attached to the streams and the inlets. Uh, and that's really where the, the focus uh, was at that time. Uh, charcoal. Uh, this picture is for, uh, one of the last known colliers. This guy's a guy by the name of uh, George Cummel. Uh, he was a, a, a collier who was making charcoal. And uh, this is from around 1950, so it's not an old picture, um, but it really shows that process. And uh, around 1740 is when you start to see a charcoal industry kind of come up in the Pinelands. Um, it was very important. Uh, charcoal was primarily used for stoves but it also was for furnaces. Uh, around that same time, we're gonna to start to see the development of a bog iron industry and the fuel for that bog iron um, was the charcoal. And uh, as it's shown here in the picture, you would build a mound of pitch pine, which is of course the most dominant tree in the pine lands. And over a few day process, you would have a fire burning within that pile and you would monitor by adding moss, adding um, different materials to kind of control the airflow. And after you know, a period of say three, four days to maybe even over a week, that pile is gonna reduce down the hunks of charcoal. Kind of like if you see in the store today, you buy like the lump charcoal, that's similar to what charcoal would have been produced here in the pine lands. Um, and you know, it was probably our most exported uh, item was charcoal. A lot of the stoves in places like Philadelphia and New York City, where there's larger population centers, um, the kitchen stoves, use charcoal because it burnt much better and was much more consistent than just regular wood. So uh, we exported a lot of charcoal, but we used a lot of charcoal here, primarily in the bog iron industry. Um, and that kind of leads us to my next set of slides. I talk about uh, the revolution and industry. And uh, by about 1760s, when you really start to see those furnaces, uh, there's generally both iron furnaces and iron, iron, iron forges. And basically the furnaces are gonna be an area where you're adding bog iron, which was dug out of uh, the local stream beds, uh, and then floated down to these furnaces. It was then um, burned or melted with uh, say some clam shells and some other flux with the charcoal. And generally um, it was kind of set up so the molten iron would then kind of run out down into channels of sand. And uh, sometimes you hear the term pig iron if you look at the bottom corner of the right-hand picture, you see that molten lava going into those channels of sand. And somebody said it looked like the sucklets of a pig. 
and that's where you get that term pig iron. Um, the bog iron wasn't a uh, very um, a perfect iron. It was had a lot of impurities to it. So that's why it had to be burned off. Um, but there was lots of it in the pine lands. And from about 1740 and roughly till about the Civil War, it was really easy to dig up the bog iron and then you could float it down to uh, these numerous furnaces and forges. There probably was 30 furnaces at least in the pine lands and then probably in that same amount of number of forges because the furnace would make the iron and then the forge could either pound it down, flatten it out. Um, it was made in the cannonballs, it was made in the pots and pans. Um, so it was a pretty uh, important part. Uh, but a consequence of it was it used a lot of, a lot of wood. All those um, trees had to be cut for that charcoal. So as the bog iron industry was going on, they were just gobbling up acres and acres and acres of pine because you had to have fuel uh, to keep those fires going. Um, 1758 is kind of an interesting time period. Uh, the New Jersey legislature starts one of the first uh, Native American or Indian reservations in the country. And it's going to be set up over in uh, what is today Shemung. It was kind of like a um, Indian Mills was the original name, and it was kind of like a farming type community. Um, so some of those Lenape that lived in the area went to that reservation. Um, it didn't work out very well. And by say 1802, most of the remaining uh, Lenape had moved either to New York or just kind of assimilated into uh, the population. Um, some of them, there's still people that, in the area today that are, are relative of the Lenape. For instance, my family's always had a story about my great family, but great grandfather's mother had native was part Native American, so that is kind of part of the part of the area's uh, history as well. Um, by about 1775 is when we're going to start to see the Revolutionary War, and uh, you could kind of think about the Pine Barrens in re relationship to the Revolutionary War as pirateers and pine robbers. Um, the area was very important during the Revolutionary War. New Jersey was kind of in the middle of the Revolutionary War. There were both loyalists and non-loyalist in the area. Um, so there was lots of controversy that way. A lot of the pine robbers, I'll talk about them a little bit later, they were generally considered to be loyalists. And for the most part, the privateers were generally considered to be, um, you know, fighting for the revolution. The privateers would operate off the Jersey shore. A lot of them used some of those whaling boats that were left over from the whaling industry. And they would harass and basically steal English cargo is going up and down and really had a huge financial impact in uh, the, 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 the Britain to the point where in, um, well, first we'll talk about the Declaration of Independence in 1776. Um, by 1778, the privateers were causing such a problem, uh, the English are actually gonna have an expedition and a campaign, and they're gonna come down here to kind of the Mullet River area uh, to try to stop some of these uh, privateers. Uh, it's going to lead to a, a battle in Chestnut Neck. There's going to be a massacre in Little Lake Harbor. And, um, you know, it, it was really some of the actual fighting here during the Revolutionary War. Um, 1872, there's a, another skirmish at uh, Cedar Bridge Tavern, quite possibly the last uh, land engagement of the Revolutionary War. And that's going to involve John Bacon and some of the local militia. John Bacon was one of the more notorious um, pine robbers. And uh, that's gonna take place out in Cedar Bridge Tavern, which is part of Barnegat today, right off of Route 72 um, in the, the Cedar Bridge and Tavern area. And the Revolutionary War is gonna end in 1783 with the, the Treaty of Paris. I'll look a little closely at uh, Chestnut Neck. Uh, I know our speaker on July 30th is gonna talk in detail about the privateers, um, but this is the most significant action of the Revolutionary War in the area, so I'll cover it uh, pretty quickly. Um, in 1778, uh, there's about 14 ships and about 200 British soldiers that are gonna come from uh, New York Harbor. They're gonna make their way down into Little Lake Inlet. Uh, they're gonna come into the inlet and into Great Bay. Uh, they're gonna realize that it's very shallow. They're gonna start to run aground and really encounter one problem after another. On uh, October 6th, they're going to uh, kind of bring some uh, vessels up, say, the Mullica River. At the time, it was still the Little Egg River. And they're going to attack the little town of Chestnut Neck. Chestnut Neck is still there today. As you go over the Garden State Parkway, if you look east 
uh, over the Mullica River, you're gonna see the little village of Chestnut Neck. Um, they had built, the locals had built a little fort there in the privateers and uh, that fort was captured. Uh, most of the town was burned. And, um, and again, that was on October 6th of 1778. Um, about a week or so later, uh, the English are still in the area uh, and they're gonna come up into what's Mystic Islands today in Little Lake Harbor Township. They're going to attack some of the troops that were dispersed the area. Um, Kashmir Pulaski was the uh, cavalry commander who was sent from Trenton to come to protect this area. Uh, his um, pickets were attacked in the morning of uh, October 15th. We think anywhere from 30 to 50 soldiers were killed in the massacre. And then uh, the soldiers, the English soldiers quickly headed back out through their ships in the bay. And uh, within a couple of days, the ships they couldn't take, they scuttled or burned and they headed back up to New York. Uh, and kind of what was looked at as a failed mission. I think both the colonial forces claimed victory and so did the English, but really it didn't really help the English in any regards. They did burn Chestnut Neck, uh, but Chestnut Neck was really able to bounce right back and it didn't slow the, the privateers uh, really uh, whatsoever at all. Um, a privateer was basically a licensed captain. Uh, the colonial authorities would give you this license to be a privateer and then you could go out on the open seas and you could be a private as long as you were taking cargo from, from the English. And lots of local portions in this area, in particular Southern New Jersey, um, around the Mullica River were made from the local privateers. Uh, they were able to capture the cargoes, they would bring it in, and then they would auction off uh, the cargoes and were able to make a, a pretty substantial um, er earning during that time period. Uh, people like Ebenezer Tucker, who Tucker did is named after, another famous person is John Mathis, both of them were uh, owned numerous uh, privateering vessels and profited handsomely uh, from their efforts. Okay. Great book about it. The most detailed account of the whole story is a book called The Nest of Rebel Pirates. It was written by a guy named Franklin Kemp. Uh, he passed away a few years ago. Uh, the book is available at the Batstow Citizens Committee which has a uh, gift store in Batstow, which is at the headquarters for Wharton State Forest. If you're interested in learning about the privateers and Southern New Jersey's Revolutionary War history, uh, this is by far the most detailed account. Uh, it's called A Nest of Rebel, Rebel Pirates, and it's by uh, Franklin Kemp. Um, now the pine robbers are pretty interesting. Uh, the two most notable are John Bacon and his group was known as the Refugees. Um, they operated in kind of the Manahawkin area uh, they were notorious for, um, they captured, they captured, uh, there was a vessel captured by a Captain Stillman in Barnegat Light, who was a colonial privateer, and uh, him and his crew were attacked by Bacon on the beach in Barnegat Light and massacred, and uh, that's one of the things John Bacon was famous for. He has another skirmish in downtown Manahawkin, uh, at what time was known as the Baptist Church, where there was a few uh, injuries, and then eventually, in uh, April of 1783, John Bacon is going to be captured, banging at it, uh, and shot to death. And uh, he was considered one of the more notorious uh, loyalists. Um, we're not sure what happened to him. One of the stories says that after he was killed, his body was quartered, and he was laid to rest in some crossroads, so people would be always driving over him. Um, so that's John Bacon. Cedar Bridge Tavern. Uh, apparently, some of the local militia that was looking for John Bacon this is in December of 1772. We're at the Cedar Bridge Tavern when John Bacon and some of his fellows went to go to the Cedar Bridge Tavern and thus they had this engagement, which is a, a short engagement. I think uh, one of the colonial uh, militiamen might've been wounded. I don't believe there's any deaths. And that was uh, what may have been the last battle in the Revolutionary War in uh, I think December 27th of 1782 in uh, Cedar Bridge Tavern or Barnegat Township. Now, Joe Mulliner is kind of interesting. He's another pine robber. Uh, he was known as the Robin Hood of the Pines. He was also known as kind of like the dancing um, Joe Mulliner. It's said that he liked to go to the local taverns and pick out the prettiest lady there and dance. And uh, one of the stories says that's how they caught him. They waited for a uh, Saturday night where they were gonna have kind of a, a hoedown. He showed up to dance and that's how they captured him. Um, there are a lot of kind of uh, different stories about it, but it turns out that he was also a privateer, but he was a loyalist privateer. 
when he was actually captured, he was probably captured off of Monmouth County. Um, and he was probably, he was a captain of a whaleboat. And uh, from Monmouth County, he went to Freehold. And then from Freehold, he went to Burlington City. And it's believed that uh, he was, uh, at that point in time, he was hung at Gallows Hill, which is where, at the time, if you were convicted of a crime in, Burl in the county of Burlington, that's where you, were, you possibly were hung. Uh, there's lots of stories that he was hung in the Mulca River area. He was from the Mulca River area, we believe, but we're not sure. Uh, there's been lots of stories of his grave in that area, which is kind of unconfirmed. Um, for the most part, it's believed that he was buried at the cemetery at Gallows Hill as any other person who was convicted back in those days. But it is possible that his body was given to his wife and maybe his wife returned it to the Mulca River area. So we're really not exactly sure. Um, he was known as the Robin Hood because apparently he did steal and give some back and a lot of the local community uh, in that Mulca River area kind of supported him. He was known to kind of hide out in one of the big cedar swamps around Batstow. So, uh, but he also definitely was, you know, uh, a sailor and was part of a privateering action where he was, you know, up in Monmouth County. So that's ultimately where he got captured. So all the stories don't always add up, but still pretty interesting. Um, and there are, you know, as I said, the two most notable of those pine robbers were considered John Bacon and Joe Mullen. Um, this is a nice map. This is a map from 1776. And I like how this refers to sandy barren deserts. You look at the whole Pinelands area right there in the middle of the map. And even at that point in time, we know by 1776, there was pretty substantial populations along the coast. And even in the interior of the Pinelands, places like Batstow, but still it's referred to as sandy barren deserts. Uh, shifting sands and a bountiful harvest. Um, as I said, the early folks that came to the area were primarily uh, part of the whaling industry, but certainly by 1800 and even probably prior to that, uh, the whales are no longer gonna be right along the shore. Uh, thus you end up like in a situation like Moby Dick where you're going offshore to find the whales. Um, you know, very quickly, the whales kind of either change their pattern or they just exasperate the whales that were migrating real close to the shore. Um, the local effort is gonna switch to uh, hunting, fishing, harvesting the shellfish. Clams and oysters are gonna be the cornerstone of uh, a lot of the local economies. Um, again, in the 1800s, most of the kitchen stoves in Philadelphia and New York City were burning charcoal made in the Pinelands. So we were exporting lots and lots of charcoal. Um, in the 1920s is where you're really gonna to start to see the development of the glass industry. Uh, there's gonna be a number of uh, ethnic groups that come to the Pinelands. There's gonna be some German settlers that come to the Pinelands. They're gonna bring with them different skill sets. One of the skill sets they're gonna bring is the, the idea of uh, um, you making glass. With all the sand in the Pinelands, it was a great spot for glass making. So there's numerous glass industries that kind of develop here in the Pinelands. A lot of places might have had charcoal, bog iron, and then when the bog iron kind of ran out, they transferred into, say, the glass industry. That's absolutely the case in places like um, Batstow. Um, and there's a lot of other ethnic settlements in the Pinelands as well. There's a number of uh, Jewish settlements, a place like Mizpah, which is down between um, Mays Landing and Buena Vista was a, was a Jewish settlement. Down in the Woodbine area, there's some other Jewish settlements. Up in Jackson, not too far from Castville, was an area of uh, Russian Orthodox uh, folks. So there's a, you know, the, the Pinelands really was a true melting pot in a lot of ways. Um, there is always a strong connection to African Americans, particularly with Atlantic City. Uh, and prior to the Civil War, certainly there's lots of stories of the Underground Railroad uh, really operating uh, in, in Southern New Jersey. Um, the cranberry operations are gonna start around 1830. You're gonna see some of the earliest uh, attempts to cultivate the cranberry. Uh, which again is a native Pinelands plant and uh, still to this day it's a strong economic factor in southern New Jersey. Um, 1858, uh, this is kind of a neat glass uh, connection. Uh, there's a guy named Samuel Crowley who owned uh, at the time the Crowley Town Glassworks which is down by uh, Green Bank. It had been a glassworks for a long time. I think at one point in time it was the Atlantic uh, glassworks back closer to 1800 but around 1858 Samuel Crowley's friend is John Mason, who's a tinsmith, and the two of them are going to collaborate on what's going to become the mason jar and ultimately the patent for the mason jar. Um, I've seen pictures, if you could ever find a, 
a Crowley Town mason jar, it's probably worth a lot of money and it'll say Crowley Town right on the side. Um, but the patent, uh, John Mason got, I believe, in November 30th of uh, 1858. Um, and then, uh, as I said, in 1869, thereabouts around the end of the Civil War, you're really going to see kind of the end of the, uh, the bog iron industry. And it's going to happen for a couple of reasons. Um, when bog iron was close to the furnaces, you could dig it out of the ground and float it to the furnace and then start to process it. But the further that you got away and the more of those close resources you gobbled up, once you had to put the bog iron on a wagon and transport it overland, it was becoming more expensive. And timing wasn't so good. Around the same time, they're going to find a coal up in northeastern Pennsylvania, which burns hotter than the um, charcoal. And they're also going to find a lot of better types of iron up in that area as well. So really the, the bog iron industry is going to transfer to northeastern Pennsylvania and is really going to be focused more on coal and better iron than we had here in southern New Jersey. And so that's really kind of the ending of the bog iron industry. Um, a consequence of that is kind of interesting. A lot of the money for the bog iron was from Philadelphia. And so once that money was made, where is that money going to be invested? And uh, eventually it turns out it's going to be invested in the railroads. And that kind of leads to another uh, portion of Pinelands history when we talk about the railroads. Um, the Civil War is kind of interesting because it happens right around the same time. I won't talk too much about this, but it is kind of an interesting uh, thing I've learned over time. Um, so during the Civil War, the majority of the soldiers that fought for New Jersey were from Southern New Jersey. Uh, there was always, like I said before, a pretty good connection with the African-Americans in Atlantic City and uh, definitely uh, the Underground Railroad flourished in Southern New Jersey. But there was much more of an abolitionist movement in Southern New Jersey. In Northern New Jersey, there was a lot of big textile factories and those textile factories were very dependent upon uh, cotton and uh, you know, cotton coming in at, at an inexpensive price. So North, Northern New Jersey was probably uh, less supportive of the union than say Southern New Jersey, which is kind of interesting. I always thought it was the other way growing up. There used to be a sign right through the little town of West Creek that said Mason Dixon line. And you, if you took the Mason Dixon line and you went across from Maryland through Delaware into Southern New Jersey, it cut most of Southern Jersey below that Mason Dixon line. But it turns out, even though Southern New Jersey was more rural, more agrarian, agrarian like the South, it definitely was more uh, supportive of the abolitionist movement and the union. And thus most of the New Jersey soldiers that fought during the Civil War were from Southern New Jersey. Um, which is it's different than the way I always uh, I thought it was initially, but that's that's the way it is. Um, let's talk about the railroads. Uh, the railroads really have an interesting uh, effect on things. In 1854, the West Jersey Railroad is going to go from Camden to Atlantic City. Uh, it was part of the Pennsylvania Railroad, and that's going to really start to open things up. Uh, by 1872, uh, the Tuckman Railroad is going to be a spur, basically. It's going to go from Whiting. Uh, down through Barnegat and eventually through Manahawkins and Tuckerton. And that's really going to lead to a lot more tourism. And you're going to really start to see people now coming to the Jersey Shore. So that money from the bog iron is going to be transferred into ultimately the railroads that's going to bring people and start that new chapter, which is going to be tourism on the Jersey Shore. Um, another kind of famous rail line is the Blue Comet. The Blue Comet is going to run from Jersey City to Atlantic City uh, from 19... 29 to 1941. And in 1939, the Blue Comet is going to derail uh, near Chatsworth. I think there was a really large rain. It rained like six inches in three hours and washed out the tracks. And on August 19th, the uh, Blue Comet is going to derail near a uh, little town of Chatsworth. Um, and then the picture I got here is the, the last day that Tuckerman Railroad operated. And that's a picture that was in one of the local newspapers. So there's some pretty interesting railroad history associated with Pinelands. Um, with the demise of the bog iron, this is like Batstow needed to kind of reinvent themselves. In uh, 1876, uh, Joseph Warren, wealthy person from Philadelphia, looked around the conditions in the city and thought, man, we really could use better water in Philadelphia. So he got thinking about Batstow and the Mullica River watershed, and he proposed the plan to uh, develop a system with aqueducts and pumps to take water from the pine lands and give it to the people in Philadelphia. And uh, some of the first New Jersey environmental legislation in 1878 is gonna block that effort. It's gonna say you can't export water from New Jersey 
out into other states. So that kind of foils that plan of Joseph Wharton. Joseph Wharton was a pretty prosperous businessman. He had lots of things going on. And so he ended up basically turning Batstow, uh, which later becomes Wharton State Forest, into kind of a um, big, large agricultural kind of plantation and uh, kind of sets that area up for the, the preservation that we see today. By the 1950s, the trust that owns that land, which was Batstow, is going to sell that land to the state of New Jersey, thus creating Wharton State Forest, which is the largest state forest and one of the largest chunks of the Pinelands. And it's really a big piece in the puzzle to preserving the Pinelands. That uh, effort to make Wharton State Forest a state forest uh, really helps, and in the long run, it's one of the important steps in preserving the Pinelands. But that's what his plan was, to take all that water and send it over to Philadelphia. It wasn't a crazy, crazy idea, because even by like the 1930s and 1933, the Army Corps of Engineers had a similar plan where they were going to dam up the whole entire Mullica River watershed as a giant reservoir. Uh, and that would be you know, drinking water for a lot of people. Um, at the time, I don't think they quite understood the mechanics of the aquifer and that under the Pinelands was working as that in that same capacity, just you know, below the surface. Um, Blueberries and reforestation. This kind of turns the page around the turn of the century. Uh, 1905, Bass River State Forest is established because so many trees were cut down for all the different activities for the furnaces, for charcoal, for wood, for lumber, for cedar, for the boats, the houses. In 1905, they started Bass River State Forest as a tree plantation and they started actually planting white pines, it was not a native pinelands tree. By 1906, uh, the Forest Fire Service has started. As I said before, there's always been forest fires in New Jersey. And so whenever you have a lot of people in a forest area, you really gotta be careful. And that's been the role of the Forest Fire Service is to stop those fires. But in today, it's really about uh, controlling the fuel. So there's not, there's bad situations. Um, 1916, I wanna spend some time talking about Elizabeth White. Elizabeth White worked with a guy named Dr. Frederick Colville. He was with the Department of Agriculture. And uh, where our office is today, a place called Fenwick Manor in Browns Mills is where her family was from. And they had a large family cranberry operation over at Whitesbog. And she worked with Dr. Colville and some of the local families where she would send out into the woods to bring, bring back varieties of the different blueberries that were growing. We've got high bush blueberries, low bush blueberries. Uh, there's a number of huckleberries and dangleberries. Um, but the problem was all the big berries weren't very sweet. All the little berries were very sweet, but as far as an agricultural product, you really wanted to have a big berry that was sweet. And her and Dr. Colville were able to kind of bring some different plants together and come up with some hybrids. And in 1916, they brought the first cultivated harvest of, blueberry, of blueberries to market. And is still to this day, probably the backbone of the uh, whole entire blueberry industry in New Jersey and in the world. So that was uh, you know a little over hundred years ago pretty important. Uh, 1928, if you're ever driving around Tabernacle, you're gonna find uh, Carenza Road. It goes right through uh, portions of Wharton State Forest. Um, Emilio Carenza was a pilot uh, and somewhere he was referred to as the uh, Lindbergh of Mexico. He had flown from Mexico City to New York City where he had been stayed for a couple of days. It was in this time of the year, it was in July. And sure enough, there was a lot of thunderstorms. So his trip was delayed a couple of times. And uh, the story goes, he got a telegraph that uh, kind of um, challenged his, his manhood for not flying home right away. And apparently he got up in the middle of dinner, got down to his plane and took off right into a thunderstorm and unfortunately crashed uh, as he was flying through the Pinelands kind of between uh, Tabernacle and Chatsworth. And still to this day, there's a ceremony in July every year at the site where you see the monument here on the in picture, the limestone monument of where they uh, were able to go find Carenza after his crash. The time, the area was so sparsely developed back then, the only group of people that could be mustered was the VFW from Mount Holly. So that shows you the, the population dynamics. But anyway, every, every July, there's still a, a ceremony at the Carenza Memorial in Morton State Forest uh, honoring Emilio. Uh, Hindenburg, 1937, Lakehurst is up in the Pinelands, Lakehurst Naval Air Station. And in August of 1937, that's when the Hindenburg 
uh, was destroyed. And again, that's another thing in the Pinelands. So a little bit of uh, Pinelands history. By the 1950s and the 1960s, you really start to see people kind of getting worried about conservation of the Pinelands. Uh, there's small groups that are formed. Uh, there's a group in particular known as the Pine Barrens Conservationist, and they really started to educate. Uh, in the bottom of my uh, image here, you see beauty of the bogs and barrens. Uh, and that was an effort by a number of photographers, uh, two people in particular, Dot and Brooks Everett, uh, really started to show people the beauty of the barrens, show people the beauty of the bogs. And uh, that was really an attempt to educate people and people that started to worry about if we don't preserve these pine lands, somebody's going to do something else with them. And uh, as I said before, a key component to that was Wharton State Forest becoming the largest state forest, because that really put a large part of the pine lands in a very protective state. By 1964, sure enough, Ocean County and Burlington County had plans for the pine lands. Uh, at the time, there was the Concord supersonic jets, and they wanted to have one of those supersonic jet ports located right in the middle of the pine lands. They wanted to have a city kind of between, uh, say, Chatsworth and Stafford Township, which is the core of the preservation area today, uh, with about 250,000 people, um, which is probably as big of a population as we have in the interior of the Pinelands today. And that uh, really would have altered everything. Um, as time kind of went through, uh, New Jersey kind of lost support, and they ended up put, putting more money in the New York airports like LaGuardia, in the JFK, and that's where those supersonic jet ports went, and fortunately not developed in the Pinelands. Around that same time, John McPhee uh, was out and about. John McPhee is a pretty well-known author. Uh, he wrote a fantastic book. I suggest anyone who really wants to get more about the culture and the, the mindset of the Pine Barrens, uh, his book, The Pine Barrens, uh, came out in 1967, and uh, really he spent some time documenting what was there, the people that were there, and it's a really quick read, and I suggest it's a great way to kind of get your bearings uh, thinking about the Pine Barrens. Fortunately, John McPhee's brother was good friends with a guy named Brendan Byrne. By the late 70s, Brendan Byrne is the governor of New Jersey. Uh, McPhee ends his book more or less by saying, you better go see the Pinelands now because they're probably not gonna be here that long. And years later, Governor Byrne was able to tell John McPhee, you know, because of his actions in signing the Pinelands Protection Act, that that was not going to be the case, that the pine lands were going to be protected. One of the reasons the pine lands had to be protected was for sure, uh, also in the late 70s, with the uh, onset of Atlantic City and development that casinos were gonna bring, that meant there was gonna be much more of a population demand. And so that was all the more reason why it was time in the late 70s to think about preserving and protecting the pine lands. Folklore and folk life. There's all kinds of folklore stories. I could do this for hours and hours. Uh, probably the most notable uh, folklore is the Jersey Devil. Uh, when I first heard the Jersey Devil story when I was about four years old, I was camping at a place called Bodine Field out by Harrisville, which is the ruins you see there in the picture. And I heard the story of the Jersey Devil. And uh, this traditional story is Mrs. Leeds from Leeds Point, which is down near Smithville in Galloway Township had 12 children. And um, when she found out she was gonna have a 13th child, she said she couldn't bear to have another child. And sure enough, when that child was born, uh, he had the head of a horse, wings of a bat, a fork tail and cloven hooves. Um, there the stories start to change. One story says he ate the whole family. Another story says he lived with the family. Uh, you know, we still see lots of um, sightings and uh, there's all kinds of stories that go along with that. There's other versions of the Jersey Devil story. Um, every once in a while, you'll see a reference in the local paper of some uh, descendant of the local Jersey, of the Jersey Devil had this to say or that to say. Um, particularly from uh, 1906 to 1909, there were over 200 accounts and sightings of the Jersey Devil, Southern New Jersey, North Jersey, New York, Pennsylvania, Maryland, all over the place. So there was definitely a Jersey Devil feature, um, you know, during uh, hysteria in that, in that time period. Um, lost towns, you know, there's not a lot of ghost towns in the Pinelands to say, but there's a whole bunch of lost towns. Places like Harrisville, Friendship, Martha, all those sand roads that crisscross the Pinelands today went to these towns. When there was industry, when there was bog iron, it might've been glass industry, 
Uh, at Harrisville, for instance, they were making um, butcher's paper out of uh, salt hay. All these industries kind of went away. The people went away and nature took back over. So we've got a lot, a lot of these lost towns. Today, you can go out there and you're gonna see foundations like at Friendship, for instance. Um, it's one of, was one of the largest cranberry farms at, back in the uh, 1800s through about 1950. Uh, if you go out there today, you're just gonna find like 13 cellar holes and the remnants of the old packing house. So over time, nature's kind of taken back some of those uh, areas. Um, some of our traditional boats, you know, there was a time where you could make a living as a duck hunter. And as that, people came up with the Barnegat Bay sneak box. That was a way to duck hunt. And they made a lot of decoys. There's a lot of very famous, very valuable decoys that were made in the Barnegat Bay area, in the pine lands out of Atlantic white cedar. Same with the sneak box, also made out of Atlantic white cedar that today are worth a lot of money. And that's, you know, considered some of our, our traditional folklore or folk art. The Garvey is another, I got a picture of a Garvey right here. That's a flat bottom boat that was used primarily in oystering and clamming. Um, it dates back to the early 1700s. There was a guy from the West Creek area named Jarvis Farrow. And he's uh, generally thought of as the guy building the first Garveys. Um, there was a guy named Hazelton uh, Seaman uh, from West Creek. And he was considered one of the first people to build the Barnegat Bay Sneak Box, uh, which became a very popular boat and uh, was used for all kinds of things duck hunting, but sailing, uh, you know, it's a pretty unique part of the uh, area's history and heritage. Working the cycle. Working the cycle is a pretty important term. And if you look at a lot of our folklore and our folk history, um, many people at many times through the pine lands were able to make a living from the resources. It might be gathering pine cones, pine needles, gathering sphagnum moss. You might do that part of the year. You might go help your friend with his cranberry farm, then help pick blueberries. You might go down over to the shore and do some clamming in the uh, summertime. And then in the wintertime, you might help with some oystering. So that's that term, working the cycle, really means making a living from the area around you. And uh, that kind of leads me to the term piney. I mean, piney is kind of a very interesting term. At times, it was thought of as a derogatory term. Uh, today, most people that are from the area or live in the area would be proud to be called the piney. And it's kind of like a badge of courage. but to me, the truest sense of, the, of a piney really is somebody that makes a living from the, the pine lands around them. Uh, you know, Fred Brown was somebody in John McPhee's book who was doing just that, making a living from the pines around him. And uh, so that's really how I associate that term uh, piney. And, uh, you know, it really has to do with people living in the area and having that connection to nature. And, um, you know, one of the things of piney culture is certainly a place called uh, Albert Hall, which is down in Barnegat or Waretown. And uh, the Albert brothers in the early or mid late seventies had a cabin out in the woods in that area near Waretown where they would come, it was called the home place. And sure enough, people would come every Saturday night, bring their instruments and play down home kind of country bluegrass, just general music. And sure enough, that's kind of the sound of the pine lands. And over the years, they've moved from a couple places and today, Albert Music Hall is located in the parking lot of the Ocean Township Elementary School in Waretown on Route 532. And uh, generally they play every Saturday night from around seven o'clock to 11 o'clock. It costs you $5 to get in. And uh, it's just a good foot stop in time. And it's that traditional kind of, uh, it's kind of a mix of country, kind of bluegrass, you know, but that's, that's the sound of the Pinelands. Uh, they do a number of Sunday shows and they always work on what's a, one of my favorite Pinelands events in October, which is called the Pinelands Jamboree, which is up, held up the road at uh, Wells Mills County Park, uh, not too far down the road. Um, kind of wrap things up. Like I said, there's so much in Pinelands history. I really can't talk about it all today, but uh, that gives us something to think about in the future. But I do want to end on kind of a responsible recreation kind of thought. You know, we spend a lot of time today in the Pinelands. It's a lot of natural places, it's great places to go hiking, go walking. Uh, a lot of people drive through all those sand roads. And I just wanna ask people that when you're out there, try to leave no trace, try to leave nothing behind. I think it's real important when you're driving, stay on the roads. I mean, there's literally a thousand miles of sand roads that crisscross the Pinelands. Stay on those roads. Uh, there's no need to drive through the bogs or the ponds, the meadows. There's lots of survey lines which run to the north and fire lines which run east and west. 
They're little narrow trails and they're not meant for vehicles. So please stay off those vehicle, those, uh, those uh, types of trails with vehicles. Um, also, you know, it's legal to drive a licensed registered vehicle. So you can drive a car, you can drive an enduro motorcycle, but you can't really drive a four wheeler, an old two, two stroke dirt bike. Uh, all those things are, are just not meant for the roads that traverse the pine lands. There's lots of people about hunting and fish. I've hunted and fished my whole entire life pretty much out in the pine lands. But if you're going to do that, you want to know and follow those regulations. Um, and I always tell kids, you never know who's watching, usually with a reference to the Jersey Devil. Um, but who is watching is the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection. This is an example of where somebody has uh, done some dumping and some burning. Uh, in the background, you can see a pond here that's been kind of tore up. So uh, if you're out and about and you do see some of those behavior, uh, you can call the NJDP hotline at a 1-877-WARN-DP, or it's just a 1-877-9272-6337. That's to call uh, you know, the state forest police, the park police. Uh, and the other number is to call the conservation officers. This is for more of a wildlife violation, particularly at one of the wildlife management areas. And uh, you would wanna call 1-855-64847. And I'll leave those two numbers up for a little while if someone wants to jot them down. But uh, if you see people out there tearing a place apart, dumping stuff, uh, you know, go ahead and feel free to call because they will respond. And it does, it does make a, a difference, uh, you know, when you get out there and you report these activities. That kind of wraps things up. I'm going to, uh, with my last slide, open up for questions. If anybody has a question, please feel free to call in. Uh, I encourage you, if you do call in, mute your computer, and uh, we won't get any of the feedback from the voice, but I'll be glad to hang out and answer any questions I can for a while. Um, if you want more information, more information about the Pinelands, uh, here's our website, nj.gov slash Pinelands, and we have all kinds of videos and all kinds of other, uh, you know, Pinelands information that's very helpful for people uh, that you would be able to find. And with that, I'm going to uh, open it up for questions and um, please uh, feel free to call in with your questions and we can continue uh, and get back to a conversation. Uh, usually when I do a presentation, I look at it as a conversation. This is a little challenging where I'm talking but not talking to actually physical people in front of me. So I hope it worked out well. It was the first time I've done it and uh, call in and let me know how you felt. Okay, I went a little over time there, but uh, you know, got nothing else to do today. So I figured I might as well talk a little bit about Pinelands history. Okay. I got some time. I can tell you a little bit of my background. I mean, I said I grew up in Tuckerton. I graduated from Pinelands Regional High School and uh, I grew up with a sense of history and I wanted to become a history teacher. So I went and I got a degree in history and then I got fortunate and started working as a park ranger. I worked as a park ranger for a number of years in Gettysburg. And then I headed out west to Montana where I worked as a park ranger at a Big Hole National Battlefield. And then I transitioned over to the Forest Service and worked for the USDA Forest Service for a couple of years. And then ultimately moved back to Tuckerton to uh, work at the Tuckerton Seaport as a curator. And uh, after a few years, I went to the Pinelands Commission and I've been here for going on, I guess, 17 years now, uh, telling stories and talking about the Pinelands. Okay. Well, I'll wait a couple more minutes. I know I did go a little over time, but I, uh, it's stuff that's worthy of conversation. So I'm um, waiting here if anybody wants to call in. All right, we have a call. 
Hello, you are you are live. Uh, Hello. Hello. Yes. How are you doing? I'm good. I had a question uh, about uh, what uh, Joel said uh, right at the end. He said something about fire lines run east and west, and the survey lines run north and south. Can can, can he say something more about that? Uh, sure. Uh, that's that's me. That that's my understanding. Uh, most of the particularly the, the state forest areas are gridded with fire lines and survey lines. Oh, okay. Um, and are, are they are they marked what kind of lines they are? Like if you're lost, can you can you like use them to navigate? So, uh, so some degree. Um, we have a little bit of feedback. Could you, if you muted your computer, then we wouldn't have the feedback. Um, and I'll, I'll explain how the system works a little bit. Um, so when okay. they're doing, when they're doing a controlled burn, uh, they like to burn a small section of woods at a time. And the way they accomplish that is with these fire lines. So a fire line literally is only a couple foot wide. It's kind of more of a trench that kind of runs through the woods. Uh, Generally, okay. the ones that run north and west, north and south, I always refer to as a survey line. And then the fire lines cross them and they run east to west. So it really does, it breaks up the woods in a grid pattern. So when they do a okay. control, when they do a control burn, they try to burn one of those blocks at a time. So they'll clear the vegetation and they'll try to burn each of those little square pieces of woods one at a time. And that's how they control the fire. So they only allow it to burn from fire line to fire line, from fire line to fire line. Oh, okay. And uh, like in say in all the state forest areas, uh, particularly I spent a lot of time in Bass River because I lived down in Tarkerton. Those uh, trail they look like a trail crisscross the the woods. And so as long as you know where you're going, uh, they are a great means to navigate uh, through the forest. I I've I've done it my whole entire life. Um, they're not so much meant for a bicycle. Although if you had a bike with fat, fatter tires, you might be able to drive down the fire line, but they're- oh, I'd be walking. Hiking. Yeah, uh, they're ideal for hiking. On some of the aerial photographs, you can see the grid itself. Um, right. And the, the best navigational tool I use when I'm uh, wandering around the pine lands, I got a little handheld GPS that's got mm -hmm. uh, the topographical maps loaded on it. And uh, it really gives you a great perspective where you are at all, at all times. Um, okay, that would be that would good tip there, yep. and I always wonder what those grids were. You know, when you see like the the, the, the low down uh, uh, aerial photographs, I always wondered what those were. Yep, it, it's you know really like, awesome like like why they were done. Preservation. It's, okay. it's interesting. They have a big controlled burn. That's exactly what they're doing. Is they're going from grid to grid, from block to block as they progress, and they they really have to find out what the weather's doing, and they can only burn at certain times because. They really need to burn with the wind. Exactly. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks. That, that, that good answer to my question. Thank you very much. All right. You're very welcome. Thank you for calling right. and thank you for participating. I don't, anytime. I've, been, I've enjoyed this series uh, while I've been out, out on lockdown. I very much enjoyed them. All right. Well, we, uh, we, we like to talk to people and we had to figure a way to do it from home. And this seemed to work pretty well for us. Yeah, it did. Uh, thank you very much. Bye-bye. All right. Bye-bye. All right. Well, uh, again, if anyone else has any other questions, that was a great question about uh, fire lines and surveys. Uh, I've been lucky since I was probably about two years old. I've been walking with them with my dad, uh, particularly in uh, Bass River State Forest is where I've spent most of, most of my time wandering through the Pine Barrens. I'll let it go here for another minute. We're almost about to 1130. So if you got a question, please feel free to call in. Uh, we're, we're still live and I'm gonna, I guess, hang live here for about another three minutes.
while I have some time, I'll just uh, say that next week on, uh, I believe the um, 16th, we're gonna have a program on Pinelands plants, some of the unique uh, different plants in the Pinelands. On um, the 23rd, we're gonna have Karen Walzer and Becky the Boy talk about uh, how you can um, prepare for climate change or to combat climate change with a Jersey friendly yard. And then on, on July 30th, uh, um, Tony McNichol, who is an archeologist with the Pinelands Commission is gonna talk about the privateers. That's gonna be on July 30th. Um, that's gonna be the schedule through July. We have programs through August. I think we are gonna take a break the last week of August and the first week of September. And then uh, we'll come back that second week of September after Labor Day with uh, another round of, uh, of, of Thursday morning um, violence visitations. Okay, it's 1130. Uh, with that, I'm gonna wrap things up. I wanna thank everybody for uh, participating today. Thanks for the question. And I hope you enjoy the presentation and uh, I'll see you out there.